morning. I'm Mayor Tommy Roberts. Welcome back to the Mayor's Table. In the state of New Mexico, we just recently completed the 2017 New Mexico Legislative Session. And this morning, I'm fortunate to have with me as guests two local members of the state legislature. Um, we have Representative Rod Matoya, who is the House Minority Whip. And we have Sen uh, Senator Steve Neville, who is uh, the ranking member, Republican ranking member, on the Senate Finance Committee. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's good to have both of you with us this morning. I think our viewers always find it interesting to learn a little bit about the legislative session each year. Uh, not too long ago, we had Senator Neville with us to talk about the session going into it. It was a pre-session uh, mm -hmm. segment on the mayor's mm -hmm. table. And I think our viewers will be very interested to learn a little bit more in detail about what happened during the session. So. This morning, just simply want to uh, get from each of you your perspective about what happened in the legislative session. We do know that it's likely that we'll have a special session called, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll want to have your thoughts about a special session where we are going forward. So let's start with uh, you, uh, Rod. Uh, just tell us what happened in the House uh, this year. What was the process like? I know that it was a tough session for both of you. Uh, anyone who serves in the legislature... Mm -hmm. um, uh, has a tough job to do, and it's probably getting in harder and harder to do. But let's talk about this uh, session, and Rod, what was your experience this time? Well, uh, Mayor, it was uh, a little bit of a filling out period there for a while. We went from uh, long-time Democrat leadership. Uh, two years ago, the Republicans, or sorry, three years ago, the Republicans took over the House, and then it went back to Democrat control. And so... Uh, initially, um, there was nothing set in stone. We didn't know our counterparts' new leadership, both in the House and the Senate. Um, rather than the the uh, longtime members who who had very solid reputations as to what to expect, this was this was brand new. Um, we also went in with uh, a budget deficit um, that for the, the uh, current fiscal year. So we. We're front loaded with a uh, with a special session, quite frankly, um, at the very beginning to to shore up the uh, the budget deficit from 2017. So that all happened right at the beginning. Uh, caused at least on the on the on the house side, I think things are much more uh, uh, adversarial and. Um, I think both sides knew that uh, the only place where there was going to be any real um, possibility for uh, the governor to get strong, um, sustainable margins to uphold vetoes is on the House side. So uh, lines were drawn pretty quickly, and it, it was 60 days of a very adversarial relationship in the House uh, between uh, Republicans and Democrats. And that's, that's how it started out. It, it, it ended that way um, as well. Um, and uh, quite frankly, a very uh, progressive leadership as compared to the old uh, North Central, just liberal Democrats that had run things for years, the, the uh, very strong move uh, to the left on on everything from uh, funding um, items to social issues, it was a very leftward turn in the in the house, which uh, quite frankly we we fought the whole time. But as we all know, we ended the session with a a budget that was out of balance, um, combined with a uh, a massive tax increase to somehow for the, the Democrats to be able to say this is a balanced budget, which it really wasn't. It was a it was a out of balance budget with a large tax increase to cover what was out of balance. Before we talk about some of the details in the budgeting process and some of the challenges there, uh, Steve, I'd like to know what it was like from your perspective mm -hmm. on the Senate side during the well, session. Well, by far this was the most difficult uh, session I've been. This was my 13th session and it was the hardest one I've ever ever had anything to do with. And of course, prior to that, I was eight years on the county commission and I observed from the balcony for 
many years, and, and certainly this was the most contentious, most difficult session, I think, is, that's happened in New Mexico in a long time. It's, it was money. We were, as Rod said, we were broke the day we got there, and we were $70 million in the hole. And we had to figure out how to, how to balance that. We were able to come up with some things. We found some un, uh, utilized, underutilized funds that, uh, from agencies and so forth that we could sweep. We found uh, different ways that we could move money around, but we were able to fill that hole, and the governor accepted most of that. Um, and we ended up fixing the 2017 fiscal year, which ends this uh, June. Uh, we were able to fix that, and uh, actually our revenues have started coming in a little stronger than what we anticipated, so it looks like uh, we're going to finish the year in the black, even though there's uh, some concern that uh, maybe we won't have enough money. I think we probably will be okay for this current fiscal year. Now, the next fiscal year, Rod's right, we had a lot of disagreement on how to do it. The, uh, the atmosphere in the Senate and the House are diametrically different. It's a, it's a whole different culture in, in our side of the building and then, than it is on their side. And uh, We are vastly outnumbered from a political standpoint. We're 16 to 26. Uh, so we don't accomplish much by being uh, um, difficult to deal with. You know, we, we have to negotiate and work one-on-one uh, -on -one and it tends to, be, and there's other things. We're on four-year terms, they're on two-year terms. So their politics is much more upfront than ours. Um, it's a different culture and we just have to work a little different way in the Senate than they do in the House to, to accomplish the same things. So the challenge this session was to close this revenue, projected revenue shortfall, and I think mm -hmm. going into session it was estimated to be about $290 million for the next fiscal year, right. for this Something. coming fiscal year. Mm -hmm. But you first had to, had to deal with the current fiscal year. Mm -hmm. You did that in the first couple of weeks, right. and then the rest of the session was dealing with the ensuing budget year. Mm -hmm. Each uh, chamber of the legislature deals with that separately mm -hmm. in, in the process, and then you have to come together and uh, through some kind of consensus developing format and process, you have to send something to the governor. So talk briefly about the process uh, on each uh, side of the legislature. Rod, you know, what did you come up with that uh, you had to uh, then negotiate with the Senate? Well, uh Mayor, the, <laughs> the problem this year was, uh, quite frankly, uh, on our side, was the uh, we don't control the process anymore, which was a little different. Two, uh, two previous years, we were able to control, control the process. We knew when we started negotiating what we would be able to get to the other side. Um, so uh, as to what we were trying to get to uh, was something that, uh, that both... Uh, um, both uh, former Republican uh, House member Tom Taylor, former mayor, f formerly held my position, and, uh, and uh, Senator Scherer, concept they came up with was uh, to redo the entire uh, revenue streams uh, coming, into, uh, coming into the uh, coffers. Um, so a tax overhaul is, uh, is what we, we made our focus. Um, obviously, there's going to have to be some some revenue increases in the short term, um, but uh, because of the oil and gas situation, as it's hit San Juan County particularly hard, uh, as a state, um, it was a glaring problem for us. So we look at this as uh, having to fix uh, our tax system to be a, a reliable income stream. Um, rather than increasing uh, all of our expenditures just because oil and gas is up, which is what the other side likes to do. Every dime that comes in, they, they want to spend it. There's no saving for a rainy day. Um, so we're looking at this as, uh, since it's critical and it's a, something we're going to have to fix, we decided to draw a line in the sand that... Uh, if we have to, to do something, let's fix the system. And that was, that's what we've been negotiating for this entire time is, uh, and what we're still holding on to, why we upheld the, the governor's vetoes, is because we want to make sure if we're going to go in and raise taxes, let's try and make this be the last time. Let's, let's get something to where it's a, a positive uh, revenue source, um, but is more fair, more equal. In the end, we're hoping to be able to drop the um, capital gains tax down substantially. Um, we're hoping uh, dropping it down uh, 
one and a half uh, to two percent, uh, and that not down to that, but down that much, down to the six percent range, which uh, we would always we would also in that probably have to in, uh, reinstitute the food tax at least at the local level. Um, that would make it uh, a, a reliable source for the for the cities in particular. Um, not every once again, everything that we're looking at is unpopular. But if we're going to have to do this, let's let's get it in a place where we don't have to mess with it anymore, where the cities can count on what they're going to get, um, rather than hold harmless. Uh, in this process, will probably go away completely. Um, just it's been a it's been a problem for the state. It's been a problem for the cities. It's been a problem for the counties. If we can get back to just uh, stable revenues, something you can count on. Uh, that helps us. That helps you, and and keep us in the future from having to raise taxes every time the roller coaster of oil and gas prices go up and down. So the major focus in the House was major tax uh, reform, uh, focusing on the grocery receipts tax system in New Mexico. That was probably embodied in uh, Representative Harper's bill. I always like to refer to it as the 347-page bill. Uh, I always also maintain that I could draft the fix in two pages, but mm -hmm. I probably couldn't, you know. <laughs> but. Um, the, the, at the, any rate, it, it, that was the focus. In the Senate, Steve, uh, what direction did the, the Senate well, take? The inf infamous bill that you got to pass it to understand it or whatever mm -hmm. right. uh, Representative Pelosi said. Uh, well, in, in the, you know what has happened to us is that uh, through time in the last uh, couple of decades, we've had lots of oil and gas revenues. And it's been natural, I guess, with, with all of those tax revenues coming in um, to try to move the burden off of certain groups and so forth because you have all the spare money that's and what we've done uh, there's two things that I think that have made a, a big problem with our budget and uh, the first is is that we did away with the food tax state and local tax uh, back in what 2003 or somewhere in there four, four. and uh, that is a two three hundred million dollar number it's a big number for the state then the other thing that has happened is about uh, two, three years ago, I guess, the governor uh, did the uh, expanded Medicaid. And Medicaid is approaches, will approach about $200 million before it's all said and done. When you take those two factors, and we've expanded Medicaid in general, when you take those two factors and you start looking at the budget, then when you have a downturn in oil and gas on top of it, it has created a very, very serious problem with, with balancing the budget. Those are the two biggest things. We've done other things, but those are the two biggest hits to the budget that we, we've undertaken, not that they're bad, not that they're not uh, justified in some fashion. We needed to do something about health care, and we certainly, to the degree you can, you, you don't like to tax food. But the realities are our whole tax structure was built on a certain format, and when you start tinkering around with it, there's ramifications that go way beyond uh, uh, where you think they're going, right. and uh, that's what's happened to us. And so ultimately, a bill was delivered to the governor, mm -hmm. And uh, she vetoed significant portions of it. Mm -hmm. I think that bill uh, had four or five major components to it. Can you describe, Steve, well, those the, major components in that bill? The, the base budget, the spending budget, was fairly close to what the governor's proposed budget was as far as spending, but it didn't accommodate her goals as far as the revenue side. She had different ways she wanted to accomplish that. We had fixed the education from when it came from that. The House always starts the budget, comes to the Senate. And there were some things the governor didn't like. We fixed those with education and some other factors. There were some things that uh, were in there that I know she could have line itemed it. But she chose to do some pretty draconian, draconian things in terms of the university. She vetoed the entire budget for all universities. And I'm getting uh, concerns or expressed by the universities that they're having trouble recruiting students. Uh, you know, you've got an athlete or a, or a scholarship recipient from Texas, and they've heard that the university's not funded, and you, they want to go to UNM or New Mexico State, and all of a sudden they realize the university doesn't have any money. And they don't even know, in theory, you don't even know if the university's going to open their doors next year. And that, in reality, that's not going to happen, and we know that. But if you're an out-of-state student, or if you're even a student in Las Vegas, New Mexico, you may not understand how all this works. You may be concerned about where you're, if you get another choice to go to Texas Tech. You may say, well, I'm not sure what's going on. I'm going to go to Texas Tech. So I know uh, Gary Carruthers, who's a San Juan County native, just called me a few days ago. And he's very concerned about some of his students who are 
expressing concerns about coming to a New Mexico school. And so the governor not only vetoed the funding in the bill for higher education, she vetoed the funding in the bill for the legislature. Right. Um, she also didn't like about $350 million of new revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and no, that was a separate bill. A separate but she bill. did veto the whole she bill. Ve she vetoed that. And so uh, there were some good things in, in the bill that uh, went to her. I, I think probably all would agree. I liked the uh, attention given to internet ta mm -hmm. sales taxation, uh, uh, taxing internet right. uh, transactions. That, I think yeah, that, our, that our, creates a level playing field for local brick mm -hmm. and mortar uh, Main Street type uh, retail places. Yeah, our thought was is that she would take parts of that bill. She vetoed the whole thing, but we uh, the thoughts were that uh, she would take the internet uh, tax uh, portion. She would take uh, there was a medical um, portion in there that generated I think eighty million bucks to, for the state, and between those two, that came close to balancing the budget. It, not not any reserves, but it came close to doing that. And then we figured we probably would have a special session to come in and try to figure out the other reserve portion and do something. But we thought she'd take parts of it and not veto the whole thing. She fooled us and, and vetoed the whole thing. As a result of the veto, the Legislative Council has filed a lawsuit uh, challenging the constitutionality of the veto. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, among other things, claiming that it's unconstitutional for her to line item veto or veto funding for uh, another branch of government, the legislative mm -hmm. branch. Also, uh, fundamentally unconstitutional to veto entire funding of higher education. Right. Uh, I understand that that hearing uh, has been set for May 15th at mm -hmm. the Supreme Court of the State of New Mexico. But I uh, understand that both of you think that uh, that hearing uh, might be too late, that yeah. it may be necessary for something to be done on a, on a statewide budget. Uh, I think it may... Uh even be purposeful to push it out that far, knowing that there's uh, pressures on us to get that done. It puts the uh, Supreme Court in a very difficult position because the, the question is the constitutionality of the two major portions of, of that of funding that were vetoed, the, as you mentioned, the, the legislature's budget and the higher ed, the complete higher ed budget. Um, but the question then is, does the Supreme Court then reinstitute all of that, thus creating a budget that's out of balance, which is also unconstitutional. So, And that leads us into the discussion, I think, that mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to pursue, and that is the consequence of the Supreme Court decision. So, Rod, you're telling us that if the uh, Supreme Court ruled that the vetoes were unconstitutional, then we would have a budget. It would not be a balanced budget. That would be unconstitutional in and of itself, and so you've got another problem. If the um, uh, court ruled against the Legislative Council and found the vetoes to be constitutional, uh, you're still going back into a special session mm -hmm. uh, to, right. um, to create a budget that the governor will accept. So, uh, you know, what, what's the next step? In your opinion, Steve? Well, we've certainly, one of the things that the Ledge Council, I'm not on Ledge Council, that's the organization that runs the legislature, the, the leadership of the, organ, of the legislature. They uh, uh, made a decision to start the process for an extraordinary session. I think that's premature, personally. I don't think we need to do that until the governor decides whether she's going to call one or not. When the governor calls a special session, what, uh, what she does is she says, I want to consider these issues, A, B, C, and D. And I've got two, three, or four things she wants to consider. It's restricted to what she puts on the call, is what we call, uh, we call it, is the call. The call might say, we want to um, uh, cut salaries of state employees by 10%. Well, that might not be, that might be enough to balance the budget, but it's not something that would pass. So the legislature could then use the authority to go into extraordinary session. We sign 57, is it 57 or 58% of the legislature has to sign off and says we're we want to go and call ourselves into session, then we can consider anything we want. So we could put together a process. I think at some point, if if the governor's proposals were not accept, acceptable or couldn't be passed, I think that would be a, the time that we would want to do that. But there are processes we can get uh, to that we could uh, get the le legislature back in session and pass bills. You can always override vetoes. That's another option too. 
do either of you have any strong opinion about what the budget that's ultimately submitted to the governor and ultimately adopted by the governor, what will it look like? Do either of you have a strong opinion? Well, I personally think it'll be pretty close to what uh, came out of the legislature uh, in general. I think the university funding will be back in. The legislature's funding was relatively small, but it's, it's key. We can't function without a leg legislative council, which is our attorneys, our finance guys that write, help us draft the budget, all those kind of things. We have to have those committees. They can be reduced or they can be cut, but we can't function without those committees, those staffs in place that serve our committees. So we've got to have those things. We've got to have the universities funded. So in former fashion, I think those things will come back in. Now, how we fund that, that's the real question. Are we going to cut some other areas of state government? Are we going to reduce the universities 20%? I mean, there are lots of things, options out there. We can reduce the whole budget. We can cut money out of it. We can uh, we can raise taxes. We may come up with something the governor would would uh, be agreeable to, and possibly under this restructure process that uh, Rod was talking about, where we redo the whole tax structure in large part. There may be ways that we would increase revenues in the short uh, short run, and at the same time get a new system in that would be fair and, and more balanced and better, uh, less dependent on oil and gas, those kind of goals. There's been a, a fair amount of uh, agreement on some of the particulars. Inter internet sales tax is a fairness issue. I think right. the governor even is calling it that. Um, the the hospitals concerned, uh, all of the hospitals across the state that are nonprofits, because that's an area where where there's probably going to be some some increase. Uh, there the the Particulars of it, there's some, there's a wide range of how to get that done, uh, but it, it, to some degree, that's probably going to be in there. There's a argument. Uh, the governor also vetoed the all of the capital gains, which is about 63 million dollars. There's some there's some discussion and negotiations. I'm sure will be on that whether or not that's part of the fix, because that that in the end doesn't end up in a tax increase or a cut to something else. Um, there are several. Uh, tax increases that are that are on the table, including food, um, including uh, some sort of a, a gas tax. Um, there's all kinds of things on the table. For negotiation purposes, it all has to be on the table. Uh, there's something more popular with certain members and and less popular with others, and, and that's on both sides. So, as a matter of fact, I, I would imagine that's probably why the governor vetoed the entire tax bill rather than picking. Uh, some of the things that it, it keeps in place the urgency. Mm. Uh, the urgency will probably lead to the best opportunity for reform rather than just increases. Um, so I, I think that was the purpose of it. Um, I think it puts the governor, at least in her mind, in the strongest negotiating position. I'm sympathetic with those who are concerned about this process playing out over too long a period. Mm -hmm. We're in the midst of our budget making process and uh, we are concerned that uh, the outcome may be uh, adverse or detrimental to municipalities in some mm -hmm. way. We don't know exactly what that might look like, but we're always concerned about the treatment of the hold harmless protection that we currently have. Right. It's being phased out, but it is still protection. And so we're concerned about the possibility that some money might be found by eliminating the hold harmless payments altogether without some way to recover that lost funding. Mm -hmm. That would be a, a, a crisis for local government relying yeah. on these hold harmless protections. We've, so. we've worked very hard to try to sh get the, the culture changed in the legislature to prevent just that. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether we've got it 100% or not, we've worked, a, mm -hmm. we've worked a lot on legislators, key legislators, to try to get that philosophy uh, ingrained so that uh, everybody understands that counties and cities can't function just by a wholesale elimination yeah. of the process. Yeah. Well, Rod and Steve, I, I think that's about uh, all the time we have this morning. Uh, we could talk a long time about this, and we could give our viewers a lot more detail. But I think this morning we've done a pretty good job of giving the overview and the highlights. I'd probably like to have one or both of you back after the uh, special session is concluded sure. and then talk about the result and how that's going to impact citizens in San Juan County. Do either of you have anything you'd like to add before we close? No, it's, it's just going to be a, it's a tough year, and we're, uh, we hope everybody understands that it's a very, very difficult process. Everything that we do affects somebody, and uh, there's no, no decision or process we can do that doesn't have ramifications on, on some group or some individual that uh, are not, not necessarily positive. And we, we try to avoid that to the degree you can, but you can't be 100%. 
we all appreciate the, the difficulty of that job. Yeah, I think sometimes we think that at the local level where we're face-to-face -face with our constituents, we have a tough job, but I can't imagine uh, the magnitude of the problems that you experience at the state level and legislatively with all of the different worldviews and philosophies. So mm -hmm. I very much do appreciate your efforts on behalf of the city of Farmington and the citizens of, of San Juan County. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank all of you for joining us here this morning on the Mayor's Table. We'll look forward to seeing you again next Monday.